work. And getting out and getting in the community and doing what God has has placed in us to do to bring his kingdom to the earth is what we really want to be about here at Living Water. A number of people this weekend participated in the Convoy of Hope Day of Hope. How about you make some noise if you were one of those people? Oh yeah. It was an incredible, incredible time. There was, I want to get the numbers right for you because it's just so astounding what God did to pull this many people together. We had 1,922 volunteers from churches all across the Chicagoland area, and they served over 10,000 people. Four thousand, that's right, that's worth giving God the glory. Over 4,500 people asked for prayer. Several hundred of those were first-time conversions. Many were rededications. And there was so many amazing words that were given to people about their lives at such a low point that really built them up. Most of the people left the prayer tent with tears in their eyes. I mean, they were just touched that greatly. It was amazing. They gave away bags of groceries. They did haircuts for people. They gave away school supplies. They gave away oh, almost 6,000 pairs of shoes. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. And the most important thing is the fact that Jesus' name was spoken in Chicago yesterday. And not just in some lofty way that many people can't understand, but in very real and very tangible ways. And so we are so grateful for all of you that prayed for this event, that came and worked at this event. And we just ask that you continue to pray because there are many, many, many faces that we won't ever forget. And so we ask that you keep those people in prayer that came through for services, that God would continue to meet their needs. God bless you. Amen. All right, turn in your Bibles this morning to Ephesians chapter 6, uh, where we have been in this series called uh, The Invisible War. And uh, we're going to do part three today, and part three is entitled How to Do Battle and Win. How many of you would like to know how to do battle, and better yet, how to win the battle? Because a lot of people do battle, but they don't do battle well. They, uh, they end up getting their butts kicked, right? So today, the goal of this sermon is that you don't get your butt kicked. How many of you would say, amen, I don't want to get my butt kicked? Good. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And we've been slowly going through um, some of these verses in Ephesians chapter 6. And today, we're going to look at verses 16 and 17, all right? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. In addition to all of these things, Paul says to the Ephesians, I want you to hold up the shield of faith so that you can stop the fiery arrows of the devil. He's very specific. Where do the fiery arrows come from? Who? The devil. So Paul is talking about some direct confrontation here. He says, I want to teach you how to use this shield so that you can stop the direct attacks of the devil. Verse 17. And I also want you to put on the salva salvation as your helmet, and I want you to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, two weeks ago, I talked about how you stand and resist the devil when he tries to deceive you, when he tries to come and condemn you because you failed or made a mistake, and when he comes to try and cause you to doubt yourself and to doubt God, all right? So we talked about standing and resisting, remember? Well, today I want to talk about, uh, and we talked about the defensive weapons that went along with that. Do you remember what they were? The belt of truth, the blessed breastplate of righteousness, and the shoes of peace. And here's what we learned, quick recap. We learned that the way we defeat the enemy is by putting on the belt of truth, which means living in openness and honesty with ourselves, God, and others. The second thing we talked about is we have to apply the truth by walking in obedience to God. That's the breastplate of righteousness. That's when we apply the truth. And then finally, we talked about the need to make sure that our feet are on solid ground, that we have solid footing when we're fighting, that we're not slipping around. And the way we do that is by understanding our identity 
and our authority in Jesus Christ. So we talked about all those things two weeks ago. If you weren't here, I suggest that you get the CD or the DVD today in the bookstore. Today, what I want to do is I want to talk about how to win the battle when Satan openly confronts you. Because most of the time, the way Satan works is very subtly, okay? He doesn't necessarily appear to us. He doesn't necessarily confront us in full. He likes to work behind the scenes. He likes to come in through the back door. He's very, very sneaky, right? We've already established that in this series. But there are times when he is very bold and very blatant. There are times when he will confront you face to face. In fact, two days after I preached the very first message in this series, I received a phone call from a parishioner, and they wanted to see me. And I could tell from the phone call that they were a little bit shaken. They were a little bit rattled. And so when I met with that person, they began to tell me, first of all, about all the miracles that God was doing in their family. In fact, in a two-month period, many of the things that they had been praying for, for a number of years, God had done. They had seen the fulfillment of those prayers. I mean, they were on a spiritual high. They were having victory after victory after victory. But then they said, but pastor, that's not what I want to talk to you about. That's not why I'm here. The reason that I'm here is because last night as I was laying in my bed in the middle of the night, all of a sudden I opened my eyes and suddenly a demon appeared next to me, right next to my bed. And that demon took his long black finger and stuck it down my throat so that I couldn't speak and said these words to me, Pastor, you're still my prisoner, and then vanished like that. Friends, there are times when the enemy directly confronts us in some way. Several years ago, in fact, I can tell you the time when it was. It was in the fall of, let's see, 2013, when we had experienced all of a sudden a dramatic drop in our finances here at Living Water. I mean, we had bottomed out within a week. And for four or five months, our finances were horrible. They were so horrible that we had to lay off four staff people. In the middle of that, we were not the only church in town going through that. There was another pastor in town that called me on the phone one day and said, you're not going to believe what happened to me last night. Last night, a demon appeared in the bedroom of my wife and I. Now, you have to understand, if you would know this guy, he doesn't really have a theological box for that. That's why he's calling the Pentecostal guy. See, they make fun of the Pentecostal guy until they need the Pentecostal guy. And he said, here's what the demon said. I am here because I want to drive you and Hanson out of town. My goal is to get you guys to give up and quit and go away. There are times when the demonic directly confronts us. In fact, let me tell you this morning that you can expect a direct attack on your life when four things are happening in your life. Are you ready for them? Here they are. Number one, when you make the commitment to take significant steps in your spiritual growth, the enemy will attack you. I guarantee it. When you say to God, God, I'm going to commit to growing in you. I'm going to commit to learning your word. I'm going to commit to more prayer or more worship. Satan hates that, and he will attack you. Some area of your life is going to get attacked, I guarantee it. Number two, when you invade enemy territory like we did yesterday in the heart of Chicago, when you engage in evangelism, when you start trying to reach out to people in the community, when you go on a missions trip, when you start doing outreach, let me tell you something. It's not that we should be afraid of it. I'm just warning you. The enemy will attack. Why? Because the body of Christ is on the move. And he hates when the body of Christ is on the move. Because when we're on the move, things happen. People get saved. People get delivered. Lives get transformed. And that's the last thing he wants to happen in our community. So what does he do? He attacks to see if he can get you to backpedal. He attacks to see if he can get you to stop whatever it is you're doing. So isn't it interesting when we look at the book of Acts, which is the manual for the church, 
that every time the Apostle Paul went into a new city and he began to preach the good news of the gospel, what happened? Opposition arose and he was attacked. In fact, if you read his story, it's quite amazing. He was beaten, he was mocked, he was stoned, he was flogged, he was shipwrecked. You name it. In fact, in one particular passage, he lists about 15 things that happened to him because of the preaching of the gospel. And none of them are good things. Because when you begin to preach the truth, the enemy is going to attack. Third, whenever you expose the enemy for who he is to people, he will attack you. In other words, he doesn't want you to tell other people how he operates because he does his best work in the dark. He doesn't want you to unmask him, uncover him, expose his ways to each other. Because you see, once you're onto him, once you understand his ways, it's pretty easy to know when it's him and what he's up to and to defeat him. And the fourth reason is when we repent and make a clean break with long-held patterns of sin or bad relationships, the enemy is going to attack us. Did you get that? When we start repenting, when we start saying, God, I'm not going to do that sin anymore. When we get out of bad relationships, toxic relationships, things, relationships that we have no business being involved in, the enemy attacks. For example, when couples that have been living together all of a sudden realize and they feel the conviction that it's not God honoring and they make a decision to separate, to live under separate roads until they get married, guess what? The enemy hates that because he's just been defeated. Whenever someone walks away from drugs or alcohol or pornography, the enemy is upset. Why? Because he's literally losing ground. Now, I want to tell you something this morning. Here's what we think. We think that when we give our lives to Christ, or when we more fully commit ourselves to Christ, or when we stop doing some sinful behavior in our life, that things in our life are going to get better. I've got news for you. That's just about the point that all hell is going to break loose. Why? Because the devil is mad because he's losing ground. He loves it when people live together. He loves it when con Christians continue to sin in willful disobedience. He loves it when Christians carry bitterness and unforgiveness and grudges and all this stuff. And when you draw a line in the sand and say, I'm not going to do that anymore, guess what? His first response is, oh yeah, let me throw a little adversity your way and see if I can get you to change your mind. So what do you do in those moments? You either run away or you ride out the attack because you understand that on the other side of that attack is amazing blessing and victory. It's amazing. But there's nothing that you're going to do in your life that isn't going to be challenged by the enemy. Let me tell you that right now. And if you think that's true, you're living in fantasy land. Because when you make any kind of decision to take steps toward Jesus, to do things that are right, the enemy is always going to attack. So let me go back to the story I started with. So why did the devil appear in the room of one of the parishioners in this church and say, you're my prisoner? What was that all about? Here's what it was about. They had had a string of victories. They had, a, they had a victory in their marriage. They had a victory in their finances. They had a victory in their children's lives. And the enemy was mad. And so when he comes and says, well, you know what? You're still my prisoner. It's all about intimidation. Because here's what that, that demon was saying. Your victory won't last. God's going to abandon you. Yeah, your marriage is good right now, but you know what? It's the same old, same old. In a couple of months, the cycle will reoccur, and you're going to go right back into the pit where you were. Yeah, your kids are doing well now, and they seem to have come around, but let me tell you, it's not going to last. Your finances, they're going to crash again. You're still mine, so why don't you just give up right now? It's a power play. It's about intimidation. It was about trying to sow doubt into this person's mind. Well, maybe, maybe this isn't all real. Maybe, maybe it isn't going to last. Maybe 
My marriage isn't healed. Maybe my kids aren't healed. Maybe my finances aren't going to stay turned around. You see how the enemy works? He attacks us because he wants us back. And the greater our victory, the greater the chance that it's going to be a deliberate attack. Let me give you one more. The fifth circumstance where you know the enemy is going to attack you is when God is getting ready to release blessing and victory in your life or corporately in the life of the church. Now this one I want to camp on for a moment because I think that's where we are at Living Water. Let me prophesy over you. Some of you, God is getting, to re getting ready to release the greatest victories and the greatest blessings you've ever seen in your life. And that's why you are in a time where it seems like everything is under attack. Friends, the reason some of you are under attack is because God is getting ready to release blessing and victory and revival at Living Water, and the enemy knows it, and so he's trying to attack the people of Living Water. He's trying to attack the leadership of Living Water. Listen to me. When all of a sudden, unexplained spiritual opposition arises out of nowhere, you're just minding your own business, and all of a sudden the roof collapses all around you, it's a sign that God has something special around the corner. Let me tell you, when out of nowhere, the enemy just begins to release attack on you, he knows something. He knows something that you don't even know. You see, I've been sharing some of the things that have been happening in my family since the end of May. I know exactly why they're happening. I knew from the very first day why they were happening. In fact, I knew they would probably happen before they happened. I knew that in April, the moment that Leon said, I feel led of the Lord that I'm to come to living water, I started preparing myself. Because I knew what was going to happen. And it's what's happened to many of you. Would you agree with me this morning that God is on the move at living water? Satan hates that. He senses the great thing that is happening here, and he senses the great things that are going to happen. Look, at, we're just scratching the surface right now of what I believe God wants to do over the next year. In fact, it was so funny as I was, as I was in prayer and I was worshiping and I'm, I'm, I'm working on this message, there was a... a, a a song that just kept playing over and over and over in my head and I could just hear the lyrics and it was an old Phil Collins song for those of you that are Phil Collins and Genesis fans and uh, the, the lyrics just go like this I can feel it coming in the air tonight oh Lord <laughs> then it says I've been waiting for this moment all my life oh Lord can you feel it coming in the air tonight Living water, do you feel it around here? There is something in the atmosphere that you can tangibly feel. And it's something that we've been waiting for. The answers to prophetic words for a long, long time. And I want you to know that sometimes the greatest blessings and the greatest moves of God are preceded, hear me, by the greatest conflicts in our life. You've got to walk through some stuff. So... I'm, I'm in my room, it's a Monday night, and I'm, I'm, I'm working on this message, and I'm, I'm just, I'm, I've got the music up, nobody's home, so I can do whatever I want, and uh, so the music is blasting, I'm worshiping, and um, if you watch me prepare sermons, sometimes it's weird, I get up, I walk around, I worship, I sit down, type a few lines, get up, worship, whatever, and so I'm having one of those nights, I'm having a great time with God, and all of a sudden, boom, God says, I want to show you something. Because I knew everything that was happening this summer. I knew it was an attack of the enemy. I knew what the enemy's up to. I know what's going But the Lord says, let me connect some dots for you. And all of a sudden, instantly, I get this, this, this download from the Lord. And the Lord takes me all the way back to 1996. And there I am, walking in one night at 9 o'clock from, from church. I'd been at a meeting, and I walk in my home, and I hear crying. And I run to the kitchen, and there is my wife lying on the floor. And my three little children at the time around her praying for their mommy, and basically she's incoherent. And that started two years 
Two years for us, actually more than two years, but two years of really bad where Crystal was completely incapacitated. All of a sudden, my partner in ministry can't come to church anymore. She's incapacitated. She's relegated to the house. Um, she's not intelligible half the time. She can't do laundry. She can't even figure out how to boil water. And so I've got to be mom and dad and cook and cleaner and yet still run the church and do all these kinds of things. And there was this incredible attack that occurs in the summer of 1996. And many of you are familiar with that story. But then the Lord showed me. Then we get to January of 1997, and in the midst of all of that, God releases a renewal that lasts for three years at Living Water, that we see incredible things happen, and the church just explodes and grows, and amazing, amazing things happen. And then the Lord says, dude, connect the dots. The same thing's been happening to you over the last year. The battles have been more intense than they've ever been. They've been extreme. The last three months, really extreme. And he said, I'm doing the same thing again. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. What preceded 1997 was 1996. Wasn't a good year. I'm not going to bottle that year. Okay? But it led to a renewal. What's happened this year, what's happening in many of your lives, it's leading to something if we will hold on and we'll ride it out and we'll trust God. And God says, hey, I just want to connect the dots for you because I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm slow and I don't get it. There are so many things going on in my life. I don't stop and see the whole big picture. And all of a sudden, God showed me the whole thing. He said, I'm doing, it's the same thing. And he said, except this year, the first time it was basically a physical attack. He said, over this last year, it's not only been physical, but it's been an attack on your hearts. How many of you know if the devil can get at your heart, you're done, you're toast? He said he's up, that now he's after your hearts. How do we wage battle when Satan directly confronts us like this? I mean, when we know it's him, when he gets right in your face, what well, Paul tells us in verses 16 and 17. So let me just give you three simple things you can do when the enemy gets in your face. How do you win this battle? How do you wage war? Number one, you cultivate invincible faith. Paul says this to the Ephesians. He says, I want you to take up the shield of what? Faith. Now, there were two kinds of shields that were used in battle in those days. There was a small round shield, okay, uh, that sometimes warriors would use. But that's not what this verse is referring to. This verse is referring to another kind of shield. It was often referred to by the Roman soldiers as a door shield. They called it that for a reason. It looked like a door. It was four feet high and two feet wide. And what Roman soldiers used to do is these door shields actually had hooks on either side of them. And what they would do is they would line up together and they would link their shields together. They would literally hook them together to form an impenetrable wall, and then they would march together as one line. And when they did that, they couldn't be defeated. The shield, interestingly enough, was made of multiple layers. So it wasn't some thin little goofy thing. This thing was heavy because it was made of layers of iron, and then layers of wood, and they were wrapped in linen, and in between every layer there was a little space gap. And then they covered the entire thing with leather. You say, well, why did they do that? Because in war during those days, what would often happen is they would light arrows on fire. They would dip them in pitch, tar. The enemy would light the arrow. You've seen this in movies. And then they would pull back their blow, and they would send these flaming arrows, ding, 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 Ephesians. So Paul is talking to the people in imagery that they would understand. These flaming arrows would come screaming at the opposition. And when they hit, they would cause fires. 
And they would burn cities. And they would burn up people. And so the Romans needed a way to extinguish the fiery darts of their enemies. And so when these arrows would go into these particular door shields, because there was space in between them, they were designed in such a way that they would extinguish the arrow so that the fire couldn't spread. It was immediately put out. That's what Paul was talking about with us. He says, lift up the shield of faith. The faith that ta Paul is talking about in this verse is a present, active trust in Jesus Christ for victory. It's not the faith that you had last year or 10 years ago or last week. He's talking about, in the Greek, a present, active trusting in Jesus. It's an absolute confidence in Jesus, in his promises, in his power, in his timing, and in his purposes for our lives. That's your shield. So the shield you're lifting up is the shield of confidence that God's promises, power, timing, and purposes are good enough. They will prevail in the day when the enemy attacks you. Because the enemy's fiery darts are designed for one thing, to get our focus shifted off of God and onto anything else. Onto worry, onto anxiety, onto your finances, onto your marriage, onto whatever it is. Satan's goal is always to undermine your faith, undermine your confidence, undermine your trust in Jesus and his promises to you. So you've got to lift up the what? The shield of faith, which is confidence in all of those things. The shield of faith is about applying specific truths. Our response when the enemy attacks is this. To lift up the shield of faith, again, it's not something we do in the mirror, and now I lift up the shield of faith. You do that, they'll be committing you to a psych ward somewhere. Right? People are going, well, you have imaginary friends too? What does it mean to lift up the shield of faith? Here it is. One sentence, plain and simple. Believe what God has said. That's your shield of faith. To believe what God has said. It's applying specific truths from the word of God to our situation. It's quoting them aloud. It's declaring his promises, his goodness, his character, his nature. It's believing God's timing is perfect. God has got my back. If you can believe that, that's your shield of faith. It's quoting Jeremiah 29, 11. I know the plans I have for you. They're plans for good and not evil. They're plans to give you a future and a hope. Friends, this morning as you sit here, let me tell you, you have a future and you have a hope in Jesus Christ because he said so. And we exercise faith by verbally proclaiming those things. God's truths, God's promises. And when we verbally proclaim the word, what do we do? We extinguish the fiery darts of the enemy because the word of God is our shield. We hide behind it like those door shields and we march on the enemy together. And we take his territory from him. Number two, if you want to win this battle when he directly confronts you, you've got to renew your mind. Do you know that your thoughts are far more influential on what happens to you than any circumstance you're in? Because a redeemed mind, a renewed mind, is what leads to a victorious life. So Satan assaults our mind. At times, the enemy fills our mind with lust or anger, ungodly thoughts. The Roman soldiers wore a bronze and leather helmet for a reason. They understood this fact, that if something happens to your head, it's lights out, it's game over. Doesn't matter what else you're wearing. Doesn't matter what else you're carrying. If you get hit in the head, it's all over. So that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Why is God so concerned about my mind? Because your mind is the principal battlefield in the invisible war that you're in. The war takes place right here. You got that? It's right here. If Satan can distort your thoughts, if he can distort your emotions, get you to ride that emotional roller coaster, 
if he can distort the knowledge that you possess of the Most High, he's got you. Because then our behaviors, our relationships, and our lives will tank. Because all he has to do is distort those things. According to 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, putting on the helmet of salvation means taking captive every wrong, vain, deceptive, imaginary thought that rises up in our mind and casting it down. Right. Not embracing it. Not cuddling it. Not fondling it. Casting them down. Because they're not God thoughts. And I want to tell you, that can't be done with a quick morning devotional as you fly out the door. That comes when you make it a point to saturate yourself with the Word of God. Because faith can only function to the degree that we know the Word. You can't have faith in principles that you don't know. And when the battle is raging, you have to have an arsenal to draw from, right? You have to have some munitions. You've got to have some bullets, some hand grenades, some bombs, something. Where do you get those? You get them from the Word. Because hope and victory in the battle come from the biblical truths that we fill our minds with. So, question is, are you renewing your mind with the Word of God daily? Because that's where you keep your arsenal full. So that when he attacks, you just pull something out and pew. And third, this morning, how do you confront the enemy? You brandish the sword. Now, Roman soldiers carried in their armor, a light, not a big, I know we're used to those big broadswords, you know, the William Wallace thing, which is so cool. Um, I've got one of those in my office, by the way, in case staff members ever get out of control or anything like that. In fact, I think I have five or six of them. Um, but that's not the kind of sword that the Roman soldier carried. Roman soldier carried a short sword. It was only about this long, about 24 inches. And uh, it was tucked in his belt, his belt of truth. And that sword was for something very specific, hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was the weapon that he used when the enemy got close. Because how many of you know, you can't use a broadsword when someone's like a foot from you. Doesn't work well. You need something short, something that's handy, something that's quick. And so what the Roman soldiers would do, they would spend hours upon hours... And you would see them working out in their barracks outside. And they would learn how to use that sword. And they worked on dexterity. And they'd be able to spin it around. And they could do all kinds of things with it. And they got used to the feel of it. And to the point where that little short sword was almost like it was an extension of their arm. The use of it became second nature. It was like one of their limbs. They didn't even think about it anymore. I mean, they could slice and dice you and send you on your way. And you wouldn't even know what happened. Okay, So in Ephesians 6, 17, Paul tells us what that sword is for us. It's the word of God again. And, and the Greek word that Paul uses here, and this is important, is rhema, which refers to a specific word given by the Holy Spirit. He says to defeat the enemy, you need a rhema word. The difference between a rhema word and a logos word is the logos is the whole word of God. A rhema word is a specific word. It's the difference between a stockpile of weapons and one specific weapon. So a rhema word is the specific weapon. The specific verse in that moment that's going to defeat the enemy. And so to effectively use this sword, we have to be in relationship with the Holy Spirit. We have to understand that this sword that God has given us, the one that you're holding in your hand this morning, or the one that you've got on your phone or your iPad, that this, the Bible says, is a living sword made alive by a power that is beyond us. Right? This is alive. It's alive. It's living. That's why it's so powerful. Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is living, active, and sharper than any two-edged sword. And when I was reading that verse again, I immediately, my mind went to the Lord of the Rings. And I was thinking about Frodo's sword. It was called Sting in the Lord of the Rings. How many know what I'm talking about? And any time the orcs which the, were the enemy in that story, any time orcs were nearby, what happened to that sword? It began to glow blue. Why? Because it was alive. Friends, when the enemy gets near you, 
The Word of God comes alive in your mouth if you've been renewing your mind with it. It begins to glow in you. It begins to alert you that the enemy is near so that you can take him out. So let me give you an illustration of how a rhema word works. Jesus in Matthew 4 has been out in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights, and all of a sudden Satan appears to him in the middle of, uh, middle of his wilderness wanderings, and he comes to him and he starts to tempt Jesus. And every time he tempts Jesus, what does Jesus do? Jesus pulls out the sword because it's glowing red hot. And he says this, he says, it is written, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he defeats the enemy, right? And every time he says, it is written, it is with a specific rhema word. He didn't talk to the enemy in generalities. He talked to the enemy in specifics. And he declared to him, it is written. That's what we've got to do. When the enemy confronts us in hand-to-hand -hand combat, we need to brandish that sword of the spirit to defeat him. But to do that, the word of God has got to become second nature to us. Just like the sword in that Roman soldier's hand became second nature to him. And the only way that happens, you got to spend time with it. Got to spend time with it. So what I want you to understand this morning is that sometimes the enemy tries to come in through the back door. That's, that's the way he works mostly. He's very subtle. He's very deceptive. He doesn't really want to be noticed. He wants to be working behind the scenes, stirring up trouble. But there are times when the enemy directly attacks us. And when he does, Paul says the way we defeat him is to exercise invincible faith and belief in the power and promises of God, to renew our mind by believing what God has said, and by brandishing the sword of the Spirit in order to rebuke his lies with specific, powerful words from Scripture. And friends, that's how you do battle and win. That's how you win this invisible war, right? Because there are times, because you're taking steps toward God, or because we're taking steps toward God, or because God is taking steps toward us, that the enemy is going to try and get in the way and say, oh, no, I can't allow this to happen. I got to stop being subtle, and I got to be overt. I got to get right in their face. And i got to see if I can stop this thing before it's too late. And when he does, you now know what to do. Let's pray. So, Lord Jesus, I just thank you. I thank you for your grace and for your mercy. This morning, Lord, would you just illumine our minds. God, I know that in this auditorium this morning, there are numbers of people, Lord, that are in the midst because of the stances that they've taken because of the lines that they've drawn, because of what you're wanting to do that are under attack this morning. And God, I just pray that you would just come and that you would strengthen them this morning. Today, Lord, we want to put the tools in their hands to be able to stand and defeat the enemy, to be able to extinguish every fiery arrow that would be shot against them. And so, Lord, I pray that in this moment, faith would rise up. I pray, Lord, that in these moments, Lord, that you would begin to renew our minds, that you would just give us a hunger to know your word in such a way that in any situation we'd be able to pull a specific rhema word inspired by the Spirit in that moment to defeat the enemy. God, today I pray that you would just set protection around your people, Lord, that you would build a wall of fire around living water to preserve and protect the work that you are doing, Lord, and the things that you want to see raised up and done and that you would put it around your people as well. And I pray for deliverance, Lord. I pray, Lord, for fortitude and courage and strength, Lord, to outlast the enemy until the day of blessing and victory comes, which is soon. So, Lord Jesus, we just thank you. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? If I could have the ministry team come back this morning. I have a very specific call this morning. members of the ministry team would come. If you're here this morning, and if you've been under attack, we want to pray for you this morning. I feel directly led that we are to pray for people this morning who have been under attack. Your marriage has been under attack all of a sudden.
You just, all of a sudden, it's like you and your wife, you and your husband, you just like you're at each other's throat, and you're like, what is this all about? We never have this happen. Well, I'll tell you what it's all about. It's a spiritual attack. Or there are things going on with your kids, or your finances, or your health, or your mind, or your heart. If this morning, any of those things, you just feel like you've been under attack, I want to invite you to come right now and to receive prayer. If you're here this morning and you just feel like all of a sudden there's been an assault on your mind and the enemy is trying to create doubt in your mind about trusting God, about God's promises to you, about what's happening in your life and doubt is being cast, I want you to come forward and receive prayer this morning. If you need a healing this morning in your body, if all of a sudden uh, you've been hit with some kind of sickness or some kind of illness or, or uh, all of a sudden you've gotten a bad report from the enemy or, or there's aches and pains that you've never had before and it has nothing to do with old age, let me tell you, sometimes the enemy just comes in and you need prayer this morning. I want you to just come this morning. I want you to just come and receive prayer because I believe that God is going to give people breakthroughs this morning. Because I know that the enemy is on the attack. But I want to declare something to you this morning. We are on the winning side. We are going to win. God is doing a great work here. We need to be careful. We need to protect it. We need to nourish it. We need to speak into it. We need to pray into it. That everything God has for living water will come to pass. And that the enemy won't be able to do anything about it. Yeah, he'll raise his ugly head. Yeah, he'll squawk. But he's a toothless lion. Remember what I said in week one? He is already defeated. All we have to do is enforce the victory of Jesus in our lives, in our church, in our community. Because God has already spoken the final word. And so this morning, I just want to encourage you to hang in there. I know many of you have been battling. But God is on the throne. God is doing great things. There are amazing things that lie ahead, let me tell you. And we've only begun to scratch the surface of it. So, Father, I pray your blessing over each and every person today. God, I pray that you would strengthen them and keep them. I pray that you would just cause your blessing to rest upon them as they go from this place. I pray, God, that you would make a way for them. Make a way, Lord Jesus. Part the Red Seas for them. Whatever the problem, whatever the circumstance. Lord, part the Red Sea. God, open it up. Let them walk across to the promised land on dry ground. Lord, I just pray that your kingdom, as we sang about this morning, let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in their lives. And God, make us a blessing everywhere we go this week. May we change the atmosphere and the environment. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray today. Amen. Amen. Before you go this morning... I'm going to be doing a baptism class in the fireside room right by the fire, fireplace. So if you're getting baptized this Wednesday night, we're kicking off Ignite, all new electives. Um, we're doing baptisms Wednesday night, some other fun things. So if you are being baptized or you want to be baptized, meet me in the fireside room and uh, we'll get that all squared away for you for Wednesday night. God bless you. Have a great week.